Uh, I have my notes. Yeah. Great. Uh, ready. All right. In front of me. Okay, okay. We are now live. Let's see if there's any folks in the room. <laughs> we'll just wait for people to get in as they're coming in. Awesome. Um, oh, we have two more minutes left, so let's just keep it. I'm just making uh, some. No, that's not what I want to do. On my end, I should mention that I've had a few internet problems recently, so hopefully I don't disconnect. <laughs> I changed my modem, uh, I changed my router, and mm. it still caused problems, so I had to call the company today, being like, I don't think it's my router. Uh-oh, yeah. Yeah, so hopefully that doesn't happen. I tend to reconnect after a bit, but it's kind of still annoying. Yeah, yeah, I hear that. All right, cool. We have a couple of people. So I'm going to start the session. All right. Okay. Uh, hey, everyone. Thank you for joining our stream. My name is CJ, and I'm one of the organizers for Let's Games Tokyo, which is a bilingual site that runs uh, Global Game Jam every year in Tokyo. ありがとうございます。so we believe in sharing knowledge and helping each other, no matter what skill level we are. One of the special perks of our site is that we have mentors available to help you learn while you're building. And every year, our mentors do pre-jam learning sessions on specialty topics like new game engines, how to import assets into games, how to plan your games, and more. And best of all is that you can ask our mentors in person questions at the jam. We're super grateful to the mentors who have volunteered their time and energy to share their knowledge with you. Gijitsu メンターは新しいゲームエンジン、アセットの入入、うん、入入方法、結、え、so this year, our mentors are Eric, Phil, who will be talking tonight, Matt, Hello. Josiah, Jaren, Yaya, and also me. 
Um, so previously, uh, I presented on three indie game engines that you have not heard of, and tonight we're going to have uh, Philippe give a talk on from Godot to or in Unity to Godot, um, pitfalls, tools, and resources. So questions can be asked at any time during the stream. Don't be shy. I speak both Japanese and English, so depending on you can ask in any language. えっと、なんか so before I pass to Philippe, just a small request is that we are a volunteer run organization that relies on donations to provide snacks and drinks and fun activities to our participants. Please consider giving 500 to 1000 yen to us at our Ko-Fi at Global Game Jam Tokyo to support the site and our work. We really appreciate it. Um, the donation is in the bottom right corner, so you can just click on that and send us a couple of yen our way. We already started buying snacks, and um, we are really excited because we have enough budget to have really nice <laughs> snacks. Uh, like, we're going to have um, uh, like fried and dried shiitake mushrooms, which is going to be really tasty. <laughs> I like that kind of stuff. <laughs> um, so, uh, art in Japanese. Let's Games Tokyo wa volunteer no sōsuke desu no de, eto sanka sha ni eto snack ya nomimono activity o teikyō suru tame ni o kane ga kakarimasu. Global Game Jam no eto kōfai no link o toshite katsudou o ouen suru tame ni 500 yen kara eto 1000 yen o so now, without further ado, I would like to pass to Philippe. Um, please give him a round of applause and thank you so much for uh, presenting tonight. Oh, well, thank you. It's a pleasure. Uh, hello. Uh, my name is Philip. I go by Solomar online and uh, I've been at this site for mm, since 2020, I think, right? Uh, yeah. yeah, a while. <laughs> That's been a, and this is a this is my first year as a mentor. Uh, so um, yeah, I'm doing the from Unity to Godo talk. Uh, this is from a very personal experience uh, and. I've used Unity quite a bit in the past, and um, I'll talk a bit about uh, why I'm not using Unity anymore. <laughs> uh, and it's not because of uh, what happened last September, though uh, I'm sure you, if you have looked into Unity or have used Unity, or even people that I know didn't even, uh, weren't even the, in the field had heard about Unity. Like, I think my mom talked to me about it. Uh, that's how like big that news was back in September. But in any case, uh, no. Uh, so why Godot? Why did I switch to Godot? Uh, so it is pronounced, I, we've had that question in a previous, uh, uh, talk uh, in the chat. I should give me one second. I just should probably have the chat up. Uh, it'll help. Ah, there. There we go. So, where's my little thing to set up my phone so I can look at the chat more easily? Oh, there it is. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I switched to Godot. Uh, it's pronounced Godot because it comes from the French play uh, Waiting for Godot. 
and uh, I was using Unity for, like I said, quite a few years. Uh, I started using the using it for my professional job uh, as a mobile game developer. Uh, doesn't fit what I did. And I came to Japan uh, on Jet. I'm still on Jet. It's it's been a very nice experience overall, and it's had uh, it gave me time to do a lot of things, including uh, continue with small projects and game jams. But uh, more importantly, the reason I switched to Godot recently was because I wanted to do a longer term project that I started back uh, uh, last summer, and. I was faced with the decision of, do I go with Godot or do I just keep using Unity? And as I've written on this slide, uh, I was a bit tired of Unity's uh, shenanigans, to, so to speak. Um, I, I feel like if you've used Unity for as long as I have or longer, what happened back in September wasn't the exactly the first time stuff had happened. Uh, and another thing was that it started to getting more and more bloated as a software. Uh, I often use the comparison of uh, like Adobe Photoshop. Like it's a good software, but if you're doing some light picture editing, it's maybe overkill. And for what I had planned for my project, it felt like Unity would be obviously useful, but a bit of an overkill. Um, so I looked into Godot and I tried it out and it had most of the features that I personally needed. So I decided to keep working with it. Uh, and then the stuff in September happened. And I was like, yeah, maybe I'll just keep going this way. And it's been about five months now. And I'm pretty happy with my choice, even though, like Unity, it's still not a perfect engine. Uh, one thing that I will say, and I'll come back to that later, is um, it, you should maybe decide on using Godot if it fits your project. A lot of posts, a lot of discussion that I see online uh, about people with their frustration with Godot, I feel like maybe they decided on it uh, on a whim as opposed to deciding uh, in accordance to their project uh, because of September stuff, uh, but I had picked, I had like looked into it before, so it was a bit different in my case. Um, so, why should you use Godot for the Global Game Jam? Uh, that's I'm hiding part of my slide with my son. Uh, let's see, let me let me move myself a bit here. No, wrong thing. Uh, here we go. Let me put myself here. Um, so. Why should you try using Godot during a global game jam? I think that trying out a new engine is definitely a challenge. Uh, some people are into that. I'll be quite honest. I'm not the biggest fan of using new engines uh, during a game jam, especially if I'm in a team. If the entire team knows a bit about the engine or if the rest of the team are up for that challenge i think that can be fun um but it's definitely something that you should ask your team is everyone here okay with is that something that you want to do for the jam uh, and if so uh i think just like using pico 8 or renpy to try something new at the same time as doing a game jam 
is a very good setting. Uh, just take into consideration your team and the game that your team wants to make. Uh, GDScript is very straightforward, I find, uh, as far as a scripting language goes. Uh, it's very similar to Python. If you've used Python, I think you'll feel very familiar with GDScript right from the get-go. Uh, the signals do take some getting used to. And even now, sometimes I think about the signals that I'm trying to do. And I'm like, am I, am I doing this properly? And I have to like ponder the signals for a bit. And um, once you get around it, they're, re they're really useful though. And they simplify a bit of the code. Uh, they simplify the amount of code you have to write, I find. Uh, and later I have a project to show kind of some examples of that simplifications, uh, some, some of those simplifications that happen. Um, so, uh, okay. So, um, yeah, the last point was like, were you trying, were you planning on learning it at some point? Uh, if you were, I, I, I do think a jam can be nice to do that, but it is the last point on this slide for why should you, because I feel like you need to check with your team and you need to check your, what, what you want to make as a game before you decide that, uh, is everyone comfortable with doing this uh because godot is like i said not perfect uh, it has some flaws some uh have been frustrating um for different reasons than why unity problems are frustrating i feel like if people have problems or have a bug in unity um it's quite easy to find someone else online that has a similar bug and maybe unity hasn't fixed it in God knows how long. And people have just been using the same workaround for ever since that bug has been reported. I think for Godot, it's a bit different. It is a open source project. It is like community driven, uh, and they do have funding, which is really nice to hire people directly now, um, more so than before, uh, but it's still, they don't have as much resource to fix some of the things. And so when you Google some stuff, it could, it can be harder to get around some bugs that you're like, is this, is there a workaround to this? And half the time the answer is no, uh, or maybe not. Uh, so do consider that when approaching, uh, Godot, I do think it's a very nice engine. I mean, I've been using it for five months and, uh, it's okay. Uh, so, um, to get into this slide that I didn't finish, uh, I wrote down a few things that you should be aware of, um, uh, when using Godot. So one of the most important things I put it at the top, because I do think that it might be the main thing people run into, uh, and they're working on it, but rename, renaming files and moving around folders, restructuring your project. If you decide to use Godot. Do make sure you plan out your projects inside folder arrangement properly. And if you have to change it, ask yourself it's, if it's really necessary. Um, there are ways and I'll be on site, so it shouldn't be too big of a problem, but 
what happens is if you move around folders, if you rename files, especially outside of the Godot environment, you your scenes and your nodes will lose their dependencies. They won't be able to find them. And you'd think that's not too big of an issue, except for the fact that when it happens, you can't actually open those scenes or nodes, which that's why they're working on it. It's, um, I, I would say is it, it's a pretty bad user experience bug. Uh, and that's why it's at the top. So just be careful if you do decide to use Godot, plan ahead, know what you are going to structure your project as, and don't touch it afterwards. <laughs> um, easier said than done, but it's good to know in advance. Um, this, this, to, to continue on this, maybe it would be best to, uh, get on in Godot to actually show uh, some stuff. Let's see here. Okay. No, that's Unity. Huh? That's Unity. Where's my Godot? Uh, that is still Unity. Oh, there it is. Great. Here. Um, give me one second. There you go. Waiting for <laughs> good one. <laughs> yeah, we. <laughs> oh man. Okay. So, uh, here we have Godot. You might notice that, hey, there's an editor here. Uh, yet yeah, there is a built in editor in Godot. I think it's pretty good, it has its flaws. Uh, one of which is I have not tried this on stream yet. Let me see if it works. Uh, let's see. No, no, no. Ah, yes, I can do that. But what I was checking is if I pop out the window of the editor, does it follow on the stream? It does not. So I'll just keep it in the editor. Um, it's a very useful in engine editor. However, uh, at the moment you can only have one script open, which is probably the thing I dislike the most about it. Uh, probably one of the things that most people dislike the most about it. Um, not the most useful thing, <laughs> but. Uh, oh, and is the uh, is it big enough? Is the size of the text big enough at the moment? I can make it bigger. Is that too big? All right, perfect. So, where was I when in my slide? Ah, yes. Some of you might not like the fact that the internet looks kind of blurry, but big enough. Ah, yeah. Mm, let me check my stream OBS. I wonder if I uh, could do something about that. Uh, <laughs> not too sure. It is a bit blurry. I can see what you mean. What if I do this? Does that help? Does that make it a bit sharper? I don't think I can tell. Maybe. Okay. So in any case, uh, if you do want to use, uh, an external editor, it's not in the project setting. 
<laughs> it's in uh, text editor. Use external editor. You can see here I have uh, code as my possible external editor. Um, I'm very used to Visual Studio, but at the same time, there are some nice things about having the editor in engine. Uh, I think it comes down to someone's preference at that point. Uh, but if you do want to use Visual Studio or code, uh, just to let you know that there are plugins for Godot. So it's not a problem to get all the IntelliSense working uh, autocomplete and stuff like that. Uh, but one thing you won't have, which I find very useful, especially when I'm on the go, I like to sometimes work outside of places that might or might not have Wi-Fi. And it's something I really like. It's the search help here at the top. Let me just check if I can make the size of everything a bit bigger. Editor, custom display scale, font, main font size, let's see this up. Mm, I'm not sure if that changed anything. Oh, oh, it did. Okay. Oh, the numbers are starting to change and changes. I guess just the text is enough. All right. So search help. This is pretty much the offline version of the online, um, how do you call it? The Godot wiki. Mm, it's not, it's, is it a wiki? It's not a wiki. It's the docs. So it's, Exactly, I believe almost the same as the docs, but yes, it's the docs. And so it's really useful. Uh, I open it almost every time I forget something in the same way that you might open Google to Google something really simple that you just forget. Yes, you could. Uh, and it's pretty, it's pretty nice having it directly in edit the editor. I, I quite like that. And, uh, welcome, uh, Zach and, uh, ironic. Uh, so where was I before this? Yes. So essentially when I started using Godot, uh, signals were a bit confusing and then one time I decided to refactor stuff and moved files. And if you decide to use an external editor, be careful of renaming files because I've read that that's even more frequent that your nodes will lose their dependencies. Um, but. So when you start using Godot, you will most likely wonder, especially if you come from Unity, what's some of the equivalent things? <laughs> Just like in Unity. <laughs> true, true. Uh, what are some of the equivalent things that uh, you will want to use that you're used to in unity uh on the docs they do have a page that is exactly called from unity to godot engine um if you are familiar with unity i definitely suggest looking at it 
I feel like that's what I did when I started. Um, I don't think I could do it any better than the page already does. Uh, so just letting people know about it, I think looking through it by yourself will be very helpful. However, uh, just one of the most important things to note is we're used to prefabs in Unity and uh, the equivalent here is scenes. So scenes are made of the root node and they can be any type of nodes that you want at the root. Node 2D, Node 3D, Control, which is more the GUI stuff. Um, and so nodes are everything in a sense. If uh, game objects were also scenes, for example, uh, that would be what is happening a bit here. So this node scene is just a 2D node now that I can go to my game scene, even though it's like empty. Um, and sorry, this project is not organized. <laughs> Don't do like me. <laughs> I made it yesterday. <laughs> um, and so this, where did I put it? <laughs> where did I put my node? Ah, node scene. I just have it here. And just like a prefab, I can just put it in. And it's somewhere, it's over here. It's completely empty. But if I'm on my scene... Oh, thank, thank you, Zach. <laughs> um, it'll lead you to your node scene right here. Um, so when I was doing this, uh, I realized that similarly to um, Unity, if you want to look at a insta instantiated uh, scene, you, you can. You just have to go here and make the children editable, which is something I learned while making this. So uh, it's useful, um, but I didn't find it like anywhere back when I was doing, like back when I was looking into Godot. So I feel like, like I said before, it's a very good in, it, it's a very nice engine, but it doesn't necessarily have all the documentation that you would necessarily expect uh, from like Unity in terms of this feature is here. Uh, I feel like the edit editable child children, I don't know if it's new from 4.2, um, but it feels like something that could be really useful for a lot of people. And I found it by kind of accident. Uh, and that's something maybe to get used to if you want to choose Godot, uh, which is fine. Um, or let me get my notes again. All right. So, uh, All right, so you've got this thing that looks a lot like Unity. Um, but when I do press play, let me check if it's actually that I, I might have hidden my other thing. All right, uh, I'm going to have to go to OBS. Oh, yes, I did hide it. All right, um, so. 
this is very nice. Uh, it runs like pretty well, but the thing that you might notice in the background is that Godot does not, there are a few bugs. Uh, Godot does not have a live view, which to me was probably the biggest, like, oh, um, okay. Um, what, how, how can I check if stuff is doing the things I expect it to do? Uh, so maybe if you're like me and with Unity, you're very visual when in terms of, uh, when it comes to looking at your work, um, you don't have that here, but you do have, um, I'm going to close this. You do have. Hmm, wait, no, I can't close it. I'll, I'll make it run again. Um, here we go. So you have this and I'll make it a bit smaller in my OBS. I'm, I'm, I'm almost certain that at some point it's, I don't know if it'll keep running. Uh, oh, this might be okay. If you want to look at the objects in your scene, you can go to remote here. I believe you have to uh, go in debug and set some, I think, synchronized scene changes and script changes for it to apply to remote. Um, I forget what I did, but it's possible to get the current um, the current scene objects uh, and their values while it runs. You just don't get the live view like you do in Unity. And that's OK. It's just something that you need to know in advance uh, so you're not surprised. Or it's good to know in advance so you're not surprised. I was. Oh, a few bugs here. Um, so if I look at this, you can see the linear velocity is changed accordingly. Oh, can you see? Yeah, I think so. Oh, there we go. So you can totally look at your the inside of your game as it's running, just not visually. Um, I don't know what are the plans for that in the future. I think that it's fine that you can't, it takes some getting used to, but, uh, it just pushes you to do it a bit separately. You can build an on-screen debugging, like a debug HUD, etc. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so it's fine. It just, it's a different approach essentially. And I think it, I, I like it. Uh, it just took some getting used to, like I said. Um, now, uh, where was I here? Oh, <laughs> this is a really specific little thing because of how the interface is kind of laid out similarly to Unity and this talk is very much personal experience kind of thing. Uh, on the left side, you've got your scene with your current scene with the objects. And maybe it's just me. Maybe people would run into it. I'm not sure. Maybe I'm just dumb. But the toggle visibility to me, I thought it was just the toggle. <laughs> and so what happened is the first part of the game I was building was very physics based. And the way that it grayed out the name or the, the way that it reminded me of the um, Unity, like toggle, uh, an object on and off 
was just like, oh, that's what it does kind of thing. Uh, it's not what it does. It just toggles the visibility. The object is still there, is still completely present. And if it's messing up your physics for some reason, but you can't see why, it's because it only toggles the visibility. The object is very much still there. Um, maybe I was a bit unlucky with the type of game I was making um, because it wasn't noticeable at the time because of the nature of the game. But if I can avoid anyone from making the same dumb mistake as me, that would be amazing. <laughs> So that happened. Uh, now, let's see. Uh, there are a few. How do you disable it? That's a good question. So it depends on the type of object it is. If you look at a collision shape, uh, for example, or rather maybe just the tile collection I have here. This is just a node, but the rigid body here, you will have disable mode, keep active, remove. Uh, I think remove. When node process node is set to process mode disable, remove from physics simulation. So this is the disable mode. If you want to disable a physics node, in this case, Having the disable no the disable mode on remove should make it so that this specific node does not affect physics, uh, defined behaviors in physics. I've not directly tested it out, but we could do so right now. Let's see, just a test. Uh, so. Uh, ready. Mm, what was the name of the thing? It was uh, node process. So process mode is set to C disable mode. I've not used it a lot. Um, okay, so process mode equal node process disabled. Let's see, it's the one right under me here. So it should, if I put the rolling elephant at zero, hopefully it'll go through. If it doesn't, I'll, yes, okay, yeah. As you can see, completely disable. The physics is not there for that one in the center. It's a bit more work than what you have to do with Unity. Um, node mode disable. Uh, good question. Node mode. I'm, hmm. Is this something I'm going to learn on the spot? Process mode, yes. Ah, uh, yeah, you can do that. So you could always disable it here, which still isn't really like Unity, as in it's still a bit more work, it's still a bit more hidden, but in Unity, it's just usually the most left, right, uh, left, upper left, uh, check box to just disable it. 
So it is a bit more like hidden away, but yes, you can do definitely do that. And uh, I guess in this case, if you did this, made it static, it would still collide. Oh wait, um, yeah, it would. Okay, so I feel like this is the type of thing that could definitely lead to some uh, confusion as to what is happening if someone made their collision static through the Zable mode. It's like, I made it static. Why, like, but then I disabled it. Why is it still there kind of thing? I feel like that's the type of small, um, I see why it's like that, but at the same time, it could definitely lead to some confusion in my opinion. Obviously, once you know, you know, but when you're just starting out a new engine, it really is the type of thing that you're like, what, what is going on? Um, all right. So this is also the case in most engines. Uh, it's probably something that no matter which engine that you're on, reparenting your game objects, your nodes could lead to issues. One thing that has happened to me in the game I was making um, is that I needed I needed to reparent the nodes uh, for something and it did lead to a lot of collision. Yes, it, it wasn't it, it wasn't just a resource drain, though that does happen. It was actually the triggers from all the collision stuff and all the areas would launch again because of the reparenting. And like it's it's an obvious um it, it becomes obvious very quickly, but it is something to be careful of and to maybe, if you can, try to avoid it, avoid it. If you can't, try to disable the node process while it's happening uh, and hope for the best. <laughs> the physics is not... 100% um, finalized, if I remember correctly what I read. The 2D stuff, there was someone working on it, and they did a lot. And I personally think it's quite good. But there are some people that don't like it because maybe they find it a bit not as efficient as like Box 2D, which is a very old project that's been integrated in, in many engines. There is a box 2D implementation that is not official. And I've tried it. And I can see why it's not yet been made official, because it does have bugs. So this kind of leads me to my next kind of uh, part. Actually, before I go into that, there are two things, there are two types of, uh, there are two types of things that I think people will use if they do use Godot. And that are, those are timers because they're very useful for signals. Timers avoid writing a bunch of code, honestly, because you just get to send us a signal. You just start them when you want to but they do start as not one shots. So if you need a sing signal to just play once, you have to click that. If I made a new one, if I make a new timer, it starts off as idle, sure. It does, doesn't auto start, sure. But it's not set as one shot, which this may be more personal use case 
but I tend to like controlling when I start my timer. And so in the case of this one shot, I would have preferred it to be on by default. That's just a personal thing, but perhaps you uh, prefer it that this way. Just know that it starts off as not one shot by default. Um, and then when you time it out, you connect it. You can connect it easily to your node, whichever node you want it to connect to. And I think that is very useful in terms of coding for uh, Godot. Um, I do have a comparison uh, later, maybe at the end. Uh, I'll show the differences between the code here and the code in Unity and how those timers and signals allowed me to kind of reduce the amount of redundant code. Not redundant, but like um, not needing as much code to do something. Uh, it simplified things in a way. But uh, the other thing is, where did I put this? Ah, yes, here. For the animated sprite. I'm sorry, th this is very 2D oriented. Um, I've not used 3D as much, um, but hopefully I'll be able to help with 3D too. Uh, it shouldn't be too different. Maybe if you do skeleton stuff, that might be a bit difficult, more difficult for me to, to mentor, <laughs> but we'll see. Um, it works the same, yeah. So essentially, uh, one thing that's very useful about the animated sprite, uh, animated sprites are very useful, uh, but the animation looping button is here. Uh, I don't know if you could properly see where I'm pointing, but when I was trying to figure out, OK, this thing animates. It has the speed scale here. It has the frame here. It has the animation name here, offset, everything. And I'm like, where's the looping? Where, Where is the animation loop? And it makes sense to put it where the animation is, because maybe you don't want each animation to loop makes a lot more sense uh, after I think about it. Oh, yeah, sorry, my bad. So <laughs> thank you. Um, so I feel like it's, again, uh, the same kind of really particular coming from Unity aspect of where is that very obvious setting for the thing I'm looking for, and why isn't it where I think it is? So it's not in the animated sprite node property. It's actually in this sprite frame that has these animation of the sprite frame. They're linked to the animations themselves. And that's very useful in a way. But like I said, considering it is this tiny button next to the uh, speed of the animation, it took me a bit of time to realize that. Same with this tiny autoplay on load button, which yes, it's an A. Yes, it has a arrow-like look, but 
I didn't know. So that type of thing, I think, is uh, very common uh, if you're coming from Unity. But it's very much uh, stuff you can find. It's not the most well-documented online parts of Godot. Uh, there isn't a page that says, hey, your animation. Right? It's so tiny. It's like, look at this interface. It's like, it doesn't even... <laughs> it's very subtle. Yes, you can find it online, but that's like my next slide, I think. Um... I was going to, ah, yes, my next slide, and then maybe the asset library. Uh, so let's go back to, let's go back to the slide. I have to, which one is it? Ah, there we go. All right. Scattered resources. I like it, though. It's very nice. The docs, very good. Very good docs. I, I love the docs. Some of the like GDQ quests, uh, how to learn GD script, uh, some of their tutorials, amazing. Uh, the demo projects, they're not all up to date with uh, Godot 4, but a lot of them are very useful. Uh, if you're looking to do something specific with a specific node, I highly suggest looking at the demo projects to see if what you're looking to do is somewhere there. But the two first links, the Godot forums, Reddit, and obviously, you know, Googling your problem, it's a bit all over the place. Yeah, not being up to date. Yeah, that it I've most of the demos I've tried and that ask like to update uh the scripts automatically have worked with a few tweaks. So it's not too bad, but it's not ideal either, obviously. Um but yeah, the the other problem is going on the forums, going on Reddit, and then you're reading up the solution and, okay, wait, wait a second. Wait, oh, this is for Godot 3. D darn. Um, that happens. Uh, that's happened to me multiple times. Uh, a lot of the docs, yes, a lot of the docs are in uh, I think the docs are a bit less of a problem than um, than the projects and the forums, to be honest. But I think, like I said at the beginning of this talk, is the main issue that you might face with using Godot is the resources are scattered and a lot of it is for older uh, Godot 3, or a lot of it is you'll get, you'll find the uh, the GitHub issue page pull request uh, for the bug you're having, and it's been unupdated, unupdated, it, it's been like the last message is, re is recent, and it's not a priority because limited resources and understandably, but it's the type of thing that, um, yeah, that's, that's a very good point. Uh, I won't be able to mentor as much for Godot 3 because I've not personally used it, but if you're looking, if you don't care about 3d, um, and you're sure you want to do just a 2d project, uh, I've, I going with Godot 3 might be a better choice uh, in some situations. One of which is 
if you really need a tiling system, uh, you're doing something like a, anything, a lot, a lot of 2D types project, Metroidvania, uh, Celeste, like uh, a lot of tiling, you might want to go with Godot 3. The, the game I started working on uh, doesn't need much tiling. Um, I can, I don't have it prepared on this computer, sadly. Uh, I will be, I guess I'll, I'll, I can show it off at the jam itself, but it doesn't require a lot of tiling. And oh, 3D is fine on Godot 3. Oh, that's good to know. Um, like I said, I've not tried it. Uh, but that's good to hear. Uh, but yeah, for especially, I think when I started using Godot 4, it was a recent post on Reddit about the new tile set system in Godot 4, and even like the devs were saying like, yes, we know there are issues with it. We are working on overhauling the entire thing. So if you want to do something that you will want to use a tile set for, for 2D, probably go with Godot 3. But uh, obviously you can go with Godot 4. Two, uh, might just be more work. Uh, all right, so that's it for my slides, actually, because I didn't exactly finish everything on time. But nonetheless, let's look at this asset library, which is very useful. It's not an asset store. It's a very open license uh asset library that is very um uh, useful but not necessarily um what would be the proper word it's not necessarily uh not filtered but um curated curated polished Ah, yeah, polished, curated. It has some very useful things and it has some very, you could probably have done that quickly by yourself things. So it's a bit cluttered, uh, but I can show you the plugins I use and I'm sure that you can find plugins for your own use, but it does require digging through stuff a bit. Uh, all right, this project doesn't have any plugins. <laughs> um, I'll open my other project then, uh, that's fine. I think I might have to close this and open my other project. All right, I'll just do that real quick. Uh, I don't think I don't think I see. Yeah. Exclusive preview. <laughs> uh, it's actually I'm not up to date. I think uh, because I didn't push on this computer yet. Uh, or didn't pull on this computer yet, rather. But uh, all right. So asset lib. Um, my current plugins are these. The A sprite wizard. I find it really, really useful. It's really, really good. Uh, if you use A sprite, which is a very good pixel arc program uh, that I highly suggest uh, uh, if you're looking for one. Uh, 
this plugin is amazing. Uh, it's very useful. Uh, I do have a good old complex numbers that, that was for testing something out. I don't use it, but it's there. Dialog Manager, also very useful. Uh, as you can see, uh, Nathan Hode, uh, shout out to, to Nathan, because I use two of his plugins, the Sound Manager, which it's a sound manager. Uh, I had a very similar one for my Unity projects. Uh, didn't feel like porting it. <laughs> and it looks very similar to the one I used. And so why code it again? Very useful, very straightforward. Uh, thank you, Nathan. Ooh, nice. Yeah, I love A Sprite. A Sprite's really good. Uh, the dialogue manager, if you're doing anything that requires a lot of dialogue, it might take a bit of getting used to. Uh, it has its own kind of like structure, but it's pretty powerful. Uh, so thank you, Nathan, for that. Uh, and there, some of the add-ons are not directly in uh, the plugin one. And if you're doing anything touchscreen related, I found the touch input manager very useful too. I don't know if there's more than this one. There might be a different one, but this is the one I use and it's been very useful. Uh, it has, uh, if you're using a Surface tablet, it might do a few weird things, but I'm not sure if it's due to the plug plugin or due to the Surface tablet. <laughs> so um, if that happens, uh, we can look into it. And yeah, uh, so if you're looking for something specific and you think it might be something that someone has uh also ran into which is very much is very likely uh look through the asset lib it is a very good resource a lot of them have demos for demo scenes for their own um for their own uh, uh, plugins. So if you're just getting started figuring things out, it could also be a good way to to look at, uh, at, at some demos uh, other than the Godot demo page, which we have said that is not necessarily up to date with 4.x. So maybe some of these have demos that are um, up to date. So definitely check that out uh, if you decide to use Godot or if you ha or if you are using Godot and haven't checked it out, honestly, very useful. Um, let's see. What was my next thing? Was I, I was almost hmm. I feel like I'm forgetting something. Uh, I guess if I'm not forgetting anything. Um, let me see. Let, let me look at my outline here. Uh, I said this, I said that. Um, ah, yeah, I guess some, I don't know why this was so far down my, uh, note, uh, for, um, On my on my one note, but I guess I forgot to mention these things. So going back a bit, uh, 
I guess I have stuff here that I can uh, show. Uh, <laughs> no, don't question. No, uh, oh wait, it's it's right. Uh, cover making builds. I would cover making builds if uh, I've made ones. Yeah, I can do that. Uh, let me give me one second. Uh, let's see. Let's try to do that. I'll update this project and I'll try to make a build from it. Um, the other thing I, I, I forgot to mention earlier when I was comparing Unity to Godot was that uh, essentially you have your node oh, reload oh god okay let's see uh ah see here's a good example <laughs> something happened i pulled the project and uh load failed due to missing dependencies <laughs> what are some types of games that you think godot is particularly suited for I think Godot is suited for maybe a bit lighter 2D games uh, at its base. Um, the creator, uh, I forget his name now, I was trying to, but uh, from what I, from the gist I got when he's posting, I uh, get the, Yuan, thank you. Uh, I get the impression that is very much like a uh, optimize when you have to kind of mindset. Uh, and the example I can give of that is uh, like a bullet hell type of situation definitely gets, yeah. Uh, it definitely gets, um, oh, that's for game jams? I, get, I guess so, but I feel like Godot's like that in its kind of mentality. Uh, like, it's very suited to prototyping a bit like Unity is, but in I think it, if you get used to Godot, it's probably even faster. Uh, but the reason I say that is just because you don't need to optimize until like you need to, uh, that, that sounds dumb, but like, I feel like, uh, the type of game that Godot is suited for can be games that require a lot of resource, but I wouldn't necessarily focus on that at the beginning, but it definitely can. Uh, the good, the, the example of like the bullet hell, I think it was someone on Twitter that posted, uh, you don't have, like there's no garbage collection or those types of like the issues that you could have with Unity. Uh, you don't need to pool your objects as much. However, if you happen to decide to make a type of game that starts to slow down in Godot, you can pool your objects. Uh, you can download the uh, .NET version, the .NET part of Godot to maybe have that part optimized in C-sharp if you want to. Um, oh, I guess I totally forgot this part. Don't, this should have been in my slide. Don't start Godot with C-sharp. Like just try GeoScript first. Uh, I think going in with like, thinking, oh, I'm, I want to code in C-sharp because I come from Unity 
And so I want to like uh, do this in uh, C sharp is not is not the mindset you need. Uh, you just try GDScript. It's pretty easy. And once you get used to GDScript, then if you need, it's basically Python. Yeah, it is. It is. It's very simple. And so if you do need eventually down the line something that requires a bit more efficiency, uh, takes a bit less resources, something a bit faster, you can use C Sharp and you'll, you'll be used to the GDScript environment that you can get call your C sharp pretty easily, but you also know what to expect. Um, it's so much easier to learn GDScript and then learn what it needs to do to get C sharp than the other way around. So if you decide to use Godot, please use GDScript first. <laughs> okay. Uh, open anyway, because I don't know. Okay, so here, here's something that happens a lot. So this, um, this can't open, uh, can't open file peanut butter factory scene. Uh, the file could have been moved or deleted. I just pulled, something happened, but it's not the end of the world. It is a bit confusing, but it's a good moment to kind of show what happens here. And there might not be even any problem. It might just be Godot being like, oh no, you, you changed scenes while I was open. What, what'd you do? Uh, it doesn't look like there's any issues. There, there is fixed dependency. That's the other problem. It's like, what, what, what do you want me f to fix? There, there is no, there is no thing that doesn't seem to be anything to fix here. In this case, what you do is close Godot, uh, check your source tree or your Git or whatever you're using, uh, looks fine. Reopen Godot. And it should be okay. If it's not, uh, we'll figure it out. <laughs> it happens. Sometimes it, it's not, but we'll see. Uh... Huh, looks fine to me. Yep, look at that. It just uh, opens and you know, I didn't do anything. I just reopened Godot. All right. So I guess the last thing, like uh, Zach mentioned, uh, building a project, which I have not done a lot, if I'll be completely honest. Um, but I have done once. <laughs> uh, it should be project uh, export. I believe. Yes. All right. So now, ah, uh, yeah. Okay. So let me, let me uh, try to get that. It has another screen. So I need another other screen to kind of get that. There we go. All right. That's a bit big, but I'll just make it smaller. Ah, uh, yeah, I think I've already done that. Uh, manage export templates here. Um, ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, export templates for this platform are missing. Right, because I changed versions recently. That's true. All right, let's try. Uh, manage export, uh, yeah. Other installed version, sure. Download and install, I guess. 
I don't know if you guys can see that. Uh, it has multiple windows. Oh, yeah. OK, it's fine. So um, let's see, let's see. This is pretty much it after the build. If there are any questions, I think that could be a good time while this does its thing. Uh, just move this or hide it for now. I'll just hide it for now. Um, ah, yeah, that happens. I can't click. I probably want to make a web build for the jam. Yes, you probably do. That's true. I have not yet tried to make a web build, and that's a good point. I will try to make a web build and see if I run into any issues. Not not now, but like uh, before this weekend, because yeah, web builds for game jams definitely something you want to do. Something I like to do too. So uh, downloading, but yeah, if there are any questions. Uh, I was trying to use the inspector while this was go this was going, uh, but usually you, when you're in project settings and editor settings, you can't really touch the. Uh... All right. All right. Close this. Okay. Something important that I forgot to mention are groups here. Uh, you, if you're used to tags in Unity, groups are pretty much tags. Um, that's pretty much it. Uh, you can do one more thing with groups, which is useful, is send signals that are meant for a specific group. And once uh, once they receive, once the signal is emitted uh, for that group, if that group is co uh, connected to the signal, I believe. Uh, I haven't used this feature a lot, but it's useful uh, for some things. Uh, you could just call all the group at the same time. And you can make sure that something is in a group uh, for similar to how you could with tags if you want to. If you didn't want to like make a new class name for a node, you just want the node to have a specific group, and that's all. Uh, it's pretty useful. Same thing. If you don't want to use groups, there is metadata for nodes uh, you could use to add stuff here. Like you could set a string for the specific, like, yeah, that's pretty useful. Uh, I've used it for one thing, uh, forget what, but. I use it once. Um, in the scripts, export is essentially the serialized field. Uh, that's that's should be it's pretty straightforward. Um, as you may notice, uh, I like uh, maybe <laughs> having my stuff typed. Um, <laughs> maybe it's a being used to uh, that environment, but uh, I believe that when you export, if you serialize a field, they do ask you to have your variable or variant type uh, stated here. All right, let's try to build. Uh, here we go. Export project uh, should be OK, I believe. I haven't done this in a bit, but uh, let's try. Uh, 
new folder, uh, build me. Just do that. Hmm, I'm getting some errors. I could not create child. Uh, okay, no, that's fine. That's that's. There are you'll get a lot of uh, warnings in Godot. Some of which are. Uh, yes. Uh, sure, I will do that. Um, All right, let's see. Opening up this builds release. All right. So I guess this will be kind of a Let me lower the volume. I can't hear myself. <laughs> uh... All right, so this is the game I'm working on, actually. Uh, so very sneak preview type of situation here. <laughs> um, I actually presented it at Tokyo Game Dungeon uh, last weekend, like I mentioned in the Discord. Uh, let's see, put this here. Uh, No, that's not it. Um, which one is? Ah, oh, there we go. All right. Oh God, it's big. Give me one second. All right. Uh, so I presented this game at Kotokyo Game Dungeon. It's uh, it's a demo build for the game I'm working on. Uh, it's about. If if you saw the rolling elephant in the uh, demo demo, <laughs> the other game I made yesterday, uh, the other port I made yesterday, uh, this is essentially uh, that that was made like more than a year ago, I think. And the project I started working on this summer is this, and it's a bit different, uh, but uh, it's a collection of mini games of sorts. Uh, I'll leave it at that for now, but I can show you a bit of the gameplay for this mini game. So in this game, I'm trying to collect the peanuts in the uh, space station vacuum. Yes, the space nuts. It is uh, both. I can use the mouse pointer here. Uh, it is also very. It's meant to be used on tablets and stuff. Uh, but it, I think it's a good example of something you could do with uh, Godot if you wanted to. Uh, to answer uh, CJ's question earlier, what can you do with, what type of game can you do in Godot? I think 3D games, I think 2D games, uh, I think it's very open to what you want to do. Uh, and it's a bit lighter than Unity. Like I said, Unity has a lot of features. I still like, it's not, it's hard not to like Unity. I still like Unity, but it's, it's too much for what I needed. Uh, and so it's very similar to Unity. Yeah, it's very similar to Unity. And so I feel like if you're looking to make a project in Unity, but you know your project doesn't require all the horsepower that Unity has, Godot is very enticing. And I'm glad I chose it personally. Uh, yeah. Uh, there might be a small bug in the build because it should technically go to the next mini game now, but it's not. Uh, so 
because there's no more peanuts, but uh, maybe I can keep that a surprise for the jam. <laughs> that's right. If you need more horsepower, you can go with Unreal Engine. That's that's the thing. It's like, yeah, I totally agree with you, Zach. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, like CJ said, I think uh, just showing the game jam I did last year would be a good last note. Uh, let's see. My itch is here. Um, and I just keep adding more sources for this OBS scene. <laughs> But that's okay. All right. So, uh, oh, whoops, not, not changing the correct one. All right, this should be fine. Wait, that's not the, that's not the right one. Um, there you go. That's fine. That's fine. Maybe just stretch it a bit. There you go. Okay. So uh, this is my itch page. Uh, it has a lot. Uh, oh, yes. Give me one second. I'll paste. There we go. So uh, this is my itch page. Um, I have stuff for uh, related to my current project. It's not any games, but I guess I could show that off too. Uh, pressed elephant stuff. Uh, it's my secondary itch page. Uh, it's all related to the elephant you saw. I guess I could share that too. Uh, here we go. <laughs> uh, here we go. Yes. <laughs> And um, most of these are game jams. Um, all of these are game jams, except the two top that are related to the elephant. Uh, the last, the, the game jam I made last year is this one. I was in a team uh, of three, which I believe the names are in the credits, yes. And uh, let's see, it should work properly. I think so. Oh, so it was a game about a bunny trying to get all the carrots. Uh, this was made in Unity, not in Godot. Um, but you could definitely make this in Godot. Uh, And the goal is to yeah get the. I I like I do like polishing. I don't know how it'll go this year since I'm a mentor, but I do like polishing uh, game jams. And I, I feel like I should leave it at that for people to try, down uh, try it themselves because. The game changes. <laughs> the game changes a bit once you get a, a fourth carrot. So if you want to try it out, maybe I will just leave it at that. And if you if the grandma catches you, you die because she probably cooks you or something. You are a rabbit. But yeah. That's uh that's pretty much it. Uh I uh let's close this. Cool.
Yeah, thank you for showing us that. I think it's really helpful for people to know, um, how do I say, like what they can do, like what they can expect when it comes to game jam games. Uh-oh. Uh, Philip did warn me that his um, internet connection was a little spotty, so uh, we might be having some technical issues on that front. Uh, yes. Hello? Yes, you're here. You're here. Okay. Yeah, it's it's that wasn't my internet connection. That was me closing the page, uh, and I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> <laughs> right now it's dark. And now we see a picture of a sun. There we go. Oh my god, I'm not used to. Uh... Okay, is it working properly now? I mean, it's at the end, but... <laughs> yeah, you're good. All right, so yeah, uh, I, uh, you can... You can find me on the Discord, obviously. Uh, you can find me on Cohost. Uh, let me link that. I like Cohost. It's if if you're trying to jump ships uh, because we all know how Twitter is. Uh, Cohost is a nice mix of uh, blogging, Tumblr meets Twitter style. Uh, if uh, if if you like, I like the the best description. I think the, the there was a good description uh, that was mentioned uh, this past weekend with Matt. It's like uh, Tumblr has a lot of customization, which like I I I can't. I I just I like the uniformity that Twitter has in a way. Um, but Tumblr does have some nice blogging aspects to it. And I think co-host is a good mix of those two things. Uh, I am on Twitter. Uh, I will say, despite everything, I'm still on Twitter, sadly. Uh, sadly. Um, it's, let me link that. It's obviously still very used, especially here in Japan, if you want to follow creators, both artists and game devs, and honestly, everyone. Uh, I mean, Twitter is just going to implode at some point. I mean, they're not paying their bills, so... <laughs> I'm, I'm just, I just don't know when it's going to happen, so... Um, the ads have started to become horrendous. Uh, like I, I remember getting ads on Twitter being like, "Yeah, okay, sure, yeah, this, that's a like okay." The, the data was mine somewhere, but it's a pretty accurate ad. And now it's just like NFTs, and I' not quite sure. New coins, some weird stuff. Uh, yeah. Um, so the thing is, Twitter is still very much used in Japan. Uh, a lot of people still use it. A lot of those, a lot of artists. Um, so it's still very useful to be on there at the moment. I just don't know when it's going to kick the bucket. <laughs> All right. And that's about it. Uh, thank you for uh, being here, and I hope that this has been useful. Uh, CJ, if you would like to uh, close off the uh, session, I think uh, cool. you can go ahead if there's no not any other questions. Yes, I will. Uh, give me a moment. Um, you'll see a still image of me for a moment because I'm trying to fix my virtual.
touched it. Stream went blank and silent. Oh no. Uh, um, it's okay. I tried to deactivate the, I, and reactivate my I, camera. I don't know if uh, I'm okay here. I, I guess. Oh no, we're oh, good. We're, we're good. All right. I uh, um. Yeah. Me while while everything is getting fixed up, I guess uh, I will say that uh, I can help with Unity too. I haven't touched it as much as Godot in recent times, but I can do my best. Um, I can try to help with Godot three. But maybe there are a few differences that I'm not as aware of. Um, and I hope I can uh, be uh, helpful with uh, any any teams that decide to uh, go with Godot. Great. Thank you. Um, excellent. So I know I'll... there's a lot of Pico 8 at the site this year, too. Yeah. Phil, can you hear me? But yeah, I mean... Nope. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. Alright. Let's try this again. We're only three people. And... One of the team members knew how to use Godot. But they suggested we didn't because the other the last person hadn't really used unity either so um we decided to go with unity just for simplicity simplicity's sake and it ended up working out uh pretty well but i totally get you uh maybe this year it'll be different you know unity Unity stuff that happened in September, uh, maybe it'll be a bit different. Um, maybe more people will want to try out Godot. Yeah, we'll see. Um, Phil, can you hear me now? Apparently the yeah. audio was... Okay, yeah. cool. cool. It's very lightweight. It's very nice. It's a, like... It just works straight out of the box, and there's hardly a box. Uh, I cannot hear you at the moment. Oh no! I, I can't hear you. Okay. Uh, I... Um, let me know if you can hear me, folks, on the stream. Ah. Okay. Okay. Sorry. I will. All right. So I'm going Let to. Let me get on <laughs> the, the, the page of the stream instead then. Oh, I love this. This is a new. Talking. Sorry. I didn't know I was talking over you. This is a new technical difficulty. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I know, so many new ways to communicate these days. <laughs> uh, okay, poor Phil can't actually hear this, <laughs> so... Um, apologies, uh, to everybody who, um, was experiencing that confusion. I was confused at first because I was like, why would you interrupt me? But, uh, no, <laughs> we're good. <laughs> um, I will say this to him, uh, when he can hear me as well, but, uh, I wanted to thank, uh, Phil for sharing his knowledge and thank you to everybody who, uh, who joined. <laughs> um... So tomorrow, next week at, uh, or sorry, tomorrow at 8 p.m., we're going to have Mabbies, who is in the chat right now, talking about playing with your code, doing experimental coding in Pico 8. Um, 
and uh, at the same place right here on Twitch. Uh, we are. I'm really per personally very excited for it because I've been watching him prepare for it. Um, it's going to be a little heady, a little like theory based. So it's about like it's about the process of coding um, as opposed to sort of the technical. Uh, I mean, there's probably going to be technical stuff too. But um, it's going to be really fun. Um, I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, our rogue organizer, Josiah, uh, is um, listening, but al not always around. Um, and so uh, he's going to be emceeing the, um, the closing mentor session. So I hope that you all uh, join. Yes, it is helpful for everyone, not just Pico 8 people. So like... Anybody who is interested in any game engine should check this out because um, Matt, Matt's going to talk more about how to experiment with stuff. Um, and, and I think like especially getting experimental at the jam is something that's really cool and awesome. Um, you've heard from a lot of different people uh, with a lot of different ways of interacting with code. So Mabby's is going to be a really fresh new perspective as well. Um, so as a reminder, we rely on your support for snacks and drinks and extra expenditures. Um, I can tell you as of now, uh, we've spent, um, Niman, uh, Nanahyaku N of the, the Goman N that, uh, we have so far and pretty much everything is just going to go into the jam. So if we have extra stuff. We're going to make it so that pizza is cheaper for people. Um, usually we take, uh, ask people to put in like a thousand yen or something like that. If we have extra leftover, the uh, pizza will be cheaper for people. If we can get a lot more, then um, maybe the pizza is going to be free, but I would not, uh, uh, pizza is quite expensive. So, <laughs> uh, especially here in Japan. Um, so yeah, just even 500 yen is appreciated, really appreciate it. Um, and as always, uh, we're going to be recording, we recorded this talk and we're going to upload it um, to this Twitch as well as our YouTube, which is uh, youtube.com slash GGJ Tokyo. Um, I'll put it in the, the, uh, the chat here and we're just starting to get off the ground with this so um feel free to to like or look at any of our past mentor sessions we have stuff from uh 2023 um and 2022 as well cool thank you everyone for participating have an awesome night and we'll see you tomorrow at 8 p.m thanks everyone have a good evening Bye-bye.